and um, I just want to say good morning and welcome. Um, we are, uh, these are our first few sessions of our 2013-2014 primetime at Bethel, in the library, of course. And primetime is a collaborative project between the Friends of the Library, um, the library staff, uh, faculty development, and many other um, offices on campus and off campus as well. Um, and we enjoy uh, the celebration of lifelong learning, learning beyond the classroom through um, experiences in um, the life and accomplishments of Bethel University faculty and of students as well. Um, the primetime schedule is filling in, so if you'd like a spot um, or if you'd like to see what's coming up, you can check out the uh, homepage of the new library website. Brand new website, super exciting stuff. Go there even if you don't want to see what the primetime things are, but you should check out primetime anyway. Uh, All right, good morning again. I'm Keith from the faculty development team on September 26th. Uh, I believe that's a week from today. Uh, again at 1020, uh, Dr. Adam Johnson will be speaking about human origins beliefs among Bethel undergraduate students. What do the data say? And today we welcome Sam Mulberry and Dr. Chris Garrett as they share their field report from the Digital Frontier Online CWC. Let's welcome them this morning. So, uh, thanks for coming. You've seen the two of us before. I am Sam Mulberry. This is Chris Wait, no, that's right. You're the tall one. Okay. Um, we were up here last February, March or so. Yeah. yeah. It's loading. Oh, it's loading. Uh, we were going to show you a picture of the last time we were up here. We were talking about World War One. Sam and I co led a trip to. Just at that point, we were in France at a Canadian memorial for World War One, and we were talking about a trip. And in some ways, today is about a different kind of trip. Um, Sam suggested that the theme of the week is what we did on our summer vacation. We should be here, here on Tuesday. Yeah. Adventurous trip. Our trip just took us into the digital frontier, so to speak. Um, so we'll talk more about what I'm doing with Sam's face in front of my face, um, maybe a little bit later on. Um, as we were thinking about titles, a couple of images came to mind. One was uh, Victorian explorers back from the darkest part of Africa to explain to London audiences what they, what they had seen and not really knowing. And I feel like um, this would be very impressionistic. This is not going to be uh, anything final. It's traditional. It's conditional. It's metaphorical often. And it's just based on one experience of each one. Of so chunks of salt. Yes. Um, but the, the digital frontier, I thought, um, Partly because last year we both had our 10th anniversary at Bethel and I got to write Sam's letter. And in his letter I wrote that um, Sam's office is kind of right on the frontier between Bethel past and Bethel present. feels like he is in the vanguard of a lot of things at Bethel. Um, we'll talk about media production especially, but online education is part of that. At the same time, what I appreciate about Sam as a faculty member but also as an alum is somebody who's deeply committed to the history of the place, the heritage, the missions, the Christian liberal arts. and feels like online CWC, because it's such a venerable course, nearing its 30th year, um, this is partly what we're doing. You know, we're pushing into this new horizon of online education, but at the same time trying to honor the past of the course that's pretty well established. And I think in many ways it's foundational to what we do at home. Um, and so that might be a place to start as we um, explore our impressions. Next slide. Um, so I've used this idea before talking about, uh, I did a hybrid class off the cuff a few years ago in my modern era. But I suggested that there are certain courses that work well as pedagogical laboratories. Uh, in my modern era course, it's the same kind of sequence every single year, but it changes every single year. Because I use it, because I'm so familiar, familiar with it, to try new things. So it seemed like CWC was a good place to do that as well. But there's a, a basic tension, I think, to uh, online CWC, one of many you're going to hear from us, which is we're going to this new frontier and we're trying new things. We also really want to honor the past. And so at many points, I think it occurred to us that around the mid-1980s in a J term, four really bright Bethel professors, two of whom I see sitting here today, Kevin Craig, Mike Holmes, and then also this is Dan Taylor's head, that's Neil Edinger, um from history, um, were tasked with coming up with a new Western Civ course. And not just any Western Civ course, but one that would be distinctive to Bethel, that would do church history, philosophy, theology, literature, that would be the cornerstone of what was then a new gen ed curriculum. And I, I thought, you know, also in the midst of economic uncertainty. This was in the middle of the, the recruitment dive. There was no certainty about what was to come, and yet they sat and they planned out something new. 
and it endured. And thousands of people have been through CWC, including many of the people who teach the course. And much as we'll talk about collaboration between the two of us as being really central to CWC in general and into the online environment especially, I feel like we collaborate with these people, even though Kevin is retired. Mike came back to teach a couple years ago. Dan's retired. Neil is somewhere. In Canada, so. um, but we are collaborating with them. We, we do not feel that we can completely abandon their vision for the course, even though I mean, they feel like we could abandon some parts of it. <laughs> Did you say Virginia came back? Then? Yeah, when, when, uh, this was probably two or three years after um, the Lettingas had left, and Neil and Virginia were back on campus for something. And I was talking with them, and I remember saying to Virginia, almost apologetically, like, you know, we, we changed some things, we're doing some things different. And, and she looked at me and said, well, of course you did. Like, with, why wouldn't you do that? So I, 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 it took me a long time to realize that we can do some different things and still, you know, uh, be showing honor to this tradition as well. And, and the course has changed. I mean, I think in the last 10 years, there's just a lot of turnover in faculty. We've changed some of the structure of the course. Some of our emphases are a little bit different. And there's new genetic curriculum, so we adapt to that as well. And so the, the other horn of the dilemma, or pull of the paradox, whatever we're doing, is we did want to do the same thing. CWC is and always has been built on a couple of lectures a week and a small group discussion centered around readings where about 17 students are with a single professor they get to know over a semester. And I think our starting point, once we decided that we're doing a summer CWC, probably works best as online, is we we're going to scrap that entirely. Okay, and, and here's where the laboratory comes in. Could you still do something that resembles CWC, honors that heritage, if it doesn't have really any of the pillars of pedagogy in the course? Because I think we both agreed right away the last thing we want to do is simply record lectures and do Moodle discussion boards and do just an online facsimile of what we think we do pretty well face to face. And so instead, I mean, the very first thing we want to do is to treat this as a chance to fundamentally rethink what we do because we knew it would be just a different environment. We've never taken an online class, we've not really taught one, we didn't know anything else except we wanted to be different. And we ended up with something like this, the Kevin Craig uh, Museum <laughs> of Ancient Greece and Rome. This is one of seven virtual museums uh, that uh, we designed for the course. And Our map is right there. Here. If this you want to take a look this is the actual course. campus of online CWC. <laughs> Only Sam would think that he should not just design these museums but then have them occupy space. <laughs> Um, so we're not going to get into the details of what the course was like. A lot of you have heard versions of this before. If you're curious, come talk to us later. We can set you up in Moodle to just play around with it, or we can sit down for coffee and kind of talk you through it. But the, the three pillars here were virtual museums. We'd have a chance to do some kind of self-directed exploration using a lot of primary sources, clips of interviews with faculty talking about areas of expertise. Documentary films, we did 10 of them, usually 30 to 50 minutes long. You saw some of the um, screenshots of some of the 20 or so faculty that we interviewed, mostly back in the summer of 2012, and then spent a lot of time editing together Ken Burton style with primary source reading, the same big narration. And that was meant to give the kind of big picture, the, the narrative to introduce big questions. The museums then were where you could dive more deeply in. Um, and then third, the last thing we came up with. Um, really right at the end we came up with. very end is we thought, we didn't really think we had the wherewithal to design all that, build it as we were going. We were like a week ahead of students, and do any kind of decent discussion, whether that was Moodle or something synchronous, Skype, or whatever it was. I mean, we might build that in later, because that's an important mission. We also felt like, at some level, they've got to know our personalities. You know, Sam's voice was all over the documentaries. You know, in some ways, I'm sure my voice was, because I was writing narration. Um, but I felt like you know, we should be part of it, and so we did webisodes. Um, once or twice a week, we would pause in the middle of the unit and review, but um, we record like half-hour webisodes based on the ESPN show, Pardon the Interruption, which is a sports talk thing. We kind of run down a list of topics, do games, and it was a way to inject some of the silliness that I think. Um, and a lot of content. And a lot of content. That's right. mostly silliness. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, I don't, so I guess you get to the end of it, it doesn't look anything like CWC, and yet the people we've showed it to, who have some familiarity with the course, would probably say this seems like CWC. And the final piece here, it's already starting to work its way back into face-to-face -face CWC, which really was the other main goal we had, was you only do this to enrich the face-to-face -face course. We had no interest in replacing face-to-face -face CWC and endangering it. We think it works really well. But this is a way to re-energize it, to reinvigorate it. And even before we did this, we had a virtual museum on Renaissance art that we were using in the course. 
Um, we've started to use some of the factory interview clips, in small groups, and lecture in a couple weeks. I'm going to be lecturing on medieval piety instead of lecturing. I'm going to go through our medieval museum as a docent and just walk a group of 140 students on a tour of our museum. So, and there are other ways. We might do episodes. But, so that's the laboratory. And then it's one important way that I think this was a very successful experiment. It's already started to enrich what we do um, fall and spring. And who knows, maybe a hybrid course in JTRM. Right. What I want to talk about next is uh, some of the motivations, some of the approaches that we took as we were, um, as we were going about this. Um, and one of my frustrations really early on as we were talking about doing an online course and sort of exploring what that might look like is when I would go to workshops or listen to people talk about online stuff, I felt like I was always thrown solutions. Here's a new piece of technology that can do this. Here's a new piece of technology that can do that. And I felt like I was given solutions before I ever thought about problems. So we sort of reverse engineered it and came up with this idea that you should start with, with problems and not solutions. And then I realized, well, that actually makes more sense than starting with solutions um, anyway. Or if you want to think about another way, that invention is not the mother of necessity, right? That we, we wanted to get that back into the right order. Um, so instead what we wanted to do was see if we could sort of make sure that the technology didn't get in the way of thinking about what the course needed and what the students needed. So that's where we wanted to start and then we thought we'll build solutions. Well then once we figure out what our problems are, then we can start to think about solutions. And as, as we go through this, um, hopefully what you realize is some of those solutions we came up with were more unique because we were more concerned about what the pedagogical issue was and not what the piece of technology was and the capabilities that we had. Um, so, you know, and part of this was an attempt to be true to that, um, to that living course, that living tradition of the course. Now, if we want to think about it not in terms of problems, but in another way, uh, this is another way to sort of think about this. Um, this is a quote from a French aviator whose name I'll let Chris say because I'm not good at pronunciations of French yeah, names. Yeah, I should say that. Antoine de Sedex, which that means. Yes. I call he him. disappeared in 1944. Yeah, but, but okay. But, but what he said is, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And this is sort of our way to... Um, to sort of get around this focus on what are the best practices. In fact, we went out of our way to ignore best practices. I think I, I went out of my way not to go to um, not to go to presentations about online courses. I've never seen an online course before. I've never taught one. I've never taken one. Uh, that was kind of our goal: was to say, let's not let any of any thoughts like that get in the way of thinking about um, thinking about how we want to do this. One theme that that you're that, that will. We sort of came out of this as we talked, as Chris and I are both people who are instinctual teachers. We, um, and so this was just, so what if we just sort of taught this online course from our gut in the way we think about teaching other courses? And so let's not think about some of those other things. Um, so this led us to steer clear of, of thinking about best practices um, and instead think about the open sea. This gave us a focus on a much grander vision of what the course might be. Um, it led us to start from zero, as Chris said, or something like zero. And we didn't really start from zero because we had uh, sort of a course and some goals that we were trying to achieve with that. Um, it also meant that it had great promise, but it also promised that we were going to have to put in a lot of time and a lot of work because we, weren't, we didn't have any sort of uh, pre-created solutions to lean on. So what we did lean on instead um, was a lot of metaphors. Uh, and and I, I sort of want to warn you um, about the metaphors <laughs> and analogies because we use these to sort of motivate us, sort of for, for motivation to help us process, to help us reflect on what we were doing. Um, and this is going to come off as, as really pretentious and insufferable. And if you ever walked by Chris's office when we were talking, I'm sure it was awful to hear us talk because we need, but, but this is an important thing, we needed to do this for ourselves. Um, because this is part of what energized us through um, through the, the production. So when Chris said, you know, we did these music or these uh, documentary films, the, the, there were ten episodes. They totaled about six hours and eleven minutes. Um, to get a to get some perspective on that, Ken Burns' Civil War is 
I think it's five episodes long and it's 11 hours. So he, so he has a speech, but he also didn't do it with his friend over four months with no budget. So like, so we have that. And his is better. His is way better. But we have some some different constraints. Um, but it was an immense, immense project. Uh, my wife is here, and she can attest to the fact that I didn't exist this summer. This is I was at a computer and in my office all summer long. So. So what are some of the metaphors that we use to help us think through these things? Some of the things, if you've been to presentations that we've done, you may have heard at least this first one before. One of them um, is NASA, or, or particularly the sort of everything that led up to trying to go to the moon. So we actually talked about the course a lot this way. Um, this was one of our production metaphors. And in a way, this goes back to 2005 when we made our first film and started to think about how media was going to tie into CWC. Um, but this was a sort of the idea of going to the moon was a variation on sort of longing for the open sea. You know that that we had this big goal in mind, this thing that we wanted to get to, that we wanted to create. So it was a way to motivate ourselves to convince yourself of the importance of the task that you were doing. And I think we convinced what we needed to do was convince ourselves how important this course was, whether it really is important or not. We needed to, as we were doing it, convince ourselves that this was this really important thing because we needed to find energy to power through long day after day after day of, of, um, of production. Um, and a big piece of this wasn't just coming from us, but, but we really need to thank a lot of people who are in this room in terms of the, the, the institutional support that we got, both formally and informally. So I mean, that, that includes things like yeah. the um, online development grants, um, but also the meetings that we had with, with Barrett, the meetings we had with themselves and trained, the meetings we had with a lot of you, the support we had from a lot of you, um, helped to sort of build this up. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times this summer where I'd be walking down the hall in Bethel. If you haven't been to Bethel in the summer, it's a pretty empty place. And, you know, someone would stop me, that would, I would be surprised, and they would say, how's the online course going? And that sort of made me feel like, we really, we really are doing something. I think my favorite moment is I went to academic affairs to do something, and Michelle Graber stopped me and asked me how the course was going. And I just thought, I don't even know why you know that we're doing this, but that's great. Like, that was, the, it, it sort of, it made us feel like maybe this really was important. Again, whether it's important or not doesn't matter. We needed to feel that it was in order to do this. Um, so it, it helps get us through that. Um, and, and what it helped us do is it helped us make some of the impossible things that were necessary, it made them possible because we had to believe in what we were doing. Um, an example of this, uh, I think this is probably the last week of the course. I sent to Chris an email. I just posted, I just finished producing one of the films and posted it. And I wrote to Chris and I said, all we have left is uh, two documentaries, a webisode, and a museum. And that was supposed to be a wrap-up email. And then I wrote, P.S., that sounds like a sabbatical um, proposal. <laughs> but we were going to do that in a week to finish the course. But we had gotten to a point where this was just what we were doing. Um, so so this, this metaphor really helped us a lot to think about um, production. And, made, and I'll, I'll say to sort of fool ourselves to a certain degree of how essential this work that we were doing was. Yeah, this is mostly about self-delusion. It absolutely is. <laughs> it's also about collaboration, though. I mean, I, I thought about Apollo 13. You know, apparently, there's a sense that one of us could not have possibly done this. And Sam will say a lot more about this. But also, there is this you know, mission control is back in Houston, offering a lot of support. And then there's just a lot of problem solving and maybe making things do things for which they were not meant. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I, I, I mean, I worked this into my life. I. I I maybe uh, watched the movie The Right Stuff as I was working. I, like, I, just, it, I bought a NASA t-shirt at one point. Like, this became like a real thing I had to embody as we went through. So that's one metaphor. A second production metaphor um, is a little bit weirder. I thought the other one's weird, too. But this is a little bit weirder. Um, and we called this one Desert Island Guitar, I think, right, was, was the metaphor for this. And this is the idea of, I've always been fascinated by the, the sense of, like, what if there was a person who lived their whole life alone on a desert island and somehow they got a guitar, and they'd never heard music before, and I always wondered, like, what would they, if, if they managed to not break the guitar or burn it or try to use it as a bowl or a weapon, but if they could somehow figure out you could make music with it, what kind of music would they make? And this became a metaphor, again, for us thinking about what would an online course look like if we didn't know what online courses looked like, but we just thought, well, what, what would you do? Well, how would you try to communicate with these students? What would you try to produce? So this became a, another metaphor. Whenever we would start to do something a little weirder, we would start to refer to this as a sort of desert island guitar moment. And this, um, something really inspirational happened almost on accident. Is Kent Gerber here? Yeah, Kent. Um, he, he and Barrett Fisher invited us to um, something called Spark Fest, which was in early May, or mid-May. Um, and it was this digital humanities thing at the U. 
And I think Chris and I went the first night and sort of felt like, oh, this is not what we're interested in because it was a lot of, uh, what would, how would you describe what oh, that first was like night was academics like? Academics thinking about how to use text mining for the research. Yeah, projects. yeah, and and I was thinking, okay, well, this is going to be. I'll, I'll go to this because it feels like a day off to go to the, to the conference there, and there was lunch provided. But but I wasn't I wasn't <laughs> expecting much for the second day, and the second day was un was this unbelievably powerful experience because they there was a a panel of scholars in the arts and humanities who were pairing with people in computer science and all kinds of other fields to do the most interesting projects. And what they were doing was essentially desert island guitar things. They, would, they were taking software that was meant for one thing and realizing you could do it for another. My favorite example is there was a scholar who was looking at um, John Locke. And he wanted to think about, or he wanted to study how often does John Locke reference the King James Bible. He thought, oh, how am I going to do this? And he, uh, he ended up using a free piece of plagiarism software to compare the King James Bible and all the works of John Locke so he could instantly tell all the times that Locke was making reference to this and he realized how much his scholarship could open up because he was using this tool for something the creator never could have possibly intended, right? And I feel like there are moments where, I mean, I use, I use Adobe Captivate all the time. I'm not even sure what Adobe Captivate is supposed to be used for at this point. I know how I use it, but I'm not sure. I think that I think it probably has like a, a more sensible usage that I don't understand, but I know what I can do with it. So I think that this is another metaphor that's helpful to us. A third metaphor, which is less of a production metaphor and more of a reflection metaphor, um, uh, came in sort of what happened towards the end of the course. Um, but to, to backtrack a little bit, in June I met with the humanities team. I had the pleasure of talking with them about delivering, um, delivering digital media and sort of how you could do that. Um, and, and I tried to make a joke with them, and I talked about how I sort of sometimes feel like we're creating the robot army that's going to lead to our destruction. And Joey Horseman laughed, so I felt like, okay, that was kind of a win. Um, but I, but I, this idea was sort of spinning in the back of my head that are we creating this thing that's going to replace us? So uh, a couple days after we wrapped production and I posted um, the last video, um, the first thing I did that was not related to the course uh, is I sat down and I read Mary, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, and I was actually really disturbed reading this after creating this online course and having this image of the robot army. Um, because I, I can't tell you how much I related to, uh, to Victor Frankenstein in the first four chapters, where he's just sort of maniacally going after this project and not even thinking about what it means. And I realized that's what my whole summer was. I, wasn't, I was just in the moment of creating and creating and creating. And then I hit this point where I had to turn around and look at what we had done. And start to think about it. Um, now I will preface this by saying I'm a major creature of habit. Anybody who knows me knows that I have very set ways. I sit at the same place for lunch every day. I, I'm, I have a lot of patterns in my life and because of teaching this summer I missed one important thing which is every July, about the third week of July, I have a three to seven day existential crisis where sort of I think the world is just steam and vanity. And then I come out of it and I work on the CWC syllabus. That, that happens every summer. But because I was teaching the course, I didn't get the chance to do that. So I'm kind of going through that now as I'm thinking about this. So bear with me as, as I'm worried about this. But I thought a lot about sort of what does this thing that we did mean? Um, and the, the Frankenstein analogy kind of breaks down because right now I'd be at the point where Online CWC would be going after my friends and family. So, so that part doesn't work exactly. Uh, but there was sort of this moment of, I'm not quite sure what I think of what we created. And this brings me back to the moon metaphor and um, maybe the darker side of this. Uh, because at, at this point, as I look at the course, I think we had sort of convinced ourselves of the importance of this project and to, to energize ourselves through it. But now I'm sort of at the point where I feel like, well, we really didn't go to the moon, right? We just taught this course for 20 students. Or maybe we did go to the moon, but the moon's just a big rock. Like, <laughs> we got some cool pictures from the summer, but what does this mean, right? So that's, I think, where we want to lead now in terms of thinking about reflections, that um, how can we pull out of thinking metaphorically and starting to think more sort of practically about what are some of the so before I say things about this slide, let me say two things. Again, we have taught one online course. And number two, I'm in the middle of a class at church on the book of Revelation, and I think it's leading me to think in hyperbole. So take the next slide with that um, in mind. Here is the main takeaway. Don't teach online. Um, I think there are at least two good reasons we both felt 
not any way we can verify it. This is, I think, existential is the right word for it. But here are two very important reasons for us why I'm not sure I'd ever want to do this again. So I mentioned that we both would describe ourselves as uh, instinctual teachers. Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard, has a book out, and uh, you might have read, um, oh, it's just in the New York Times. I mean, it, he has this idea, there are two types of teachers. There are those who are driven by gut, by feel, by instinct. So they have a sense that what they're doing is working. They might never check with data, and that's the other sense. I mean, data-driven. People are looking for measurable outcomes. And right now, it seems like maybe the data driving is in the ascendancy. We probably need both. We are very clearly probably to a fault on the side of gut and instinct and feel. You know, we, we, there, there's something artisanal about maybe what we're doing. Um, and that presents a dilemma. You know, in some ways, we got into this and we're, we're sustained in our motivation and excited about it because of that. You know, we had an instinct for here's what an online course would look like. We're going to not read any of those, I'm sure, very fine books over there. We're not going to go to the workshops. We're just going to follow. You know, there's people who have taught this particular course who have a good feel for what works. We'll follow them. Um, and it creates this course where we got to the end and the instinct, instincts betrayed us. I, I had no instinctual feel for how the course went. And another thing we didn't really have time to do is to build any kind of assessment, which we would do next time. You know, at least at the level of knowledge, which to me is the least important of the things we do. But you know, did they retain information? Um, I had no idea. I, um, I think maybe so. And it kind of crystallized for me, maybe even right before the last thing we posted. It was in the ask office, as usual. And uh, Sam had a good question. Yeah, like, how do we judge the success? Well, we were, we were, again, and you got to remember, we were in NASA mindset as we were doing this. We had just finished a webisode, so we were pretty kind of high off of that. And we were talking about how well this was going. And I, without thinking about it, I turned to Chris and said, well, I said, where does this rank in your top 10 like teaching experiences? And we both kind of said, it, it does it. <laughs> like, it's, it's, like, we're, we made some really cool stuff, but in terms of like, all the things that have happened in my teaching career and Chris's teaching career, like it would, yeah, I would have to go down the list a while before I said, "Oh, this is this is something that that, that really has that sort of." Yeah. The other reason I thought about this was um, a few of you, I think, were even at a workshop we did in June about pietism in higher education. In a couple of weeks, you'll see a Skype image of David Williams, a former philosophy colleague, with me talking about um, partly teaching. We're talking about off-campus study for a chapter we're writing, but. David gave a talk in June where he started with, how do you, when you get to the class, how do you know that it was a success? And he went back to instinct. It feels like success, right? Which is the kind of squishy, pietistic thing that drove Tim Essenberg crazy for two days. And it's, it's kind of great. Um, but what, what he said is, it succeeds not because they can take a test and show, well, they know, you know when the Edict of Milan was issued, or they can define Christendom or something. But that's a relatively unimportant outcome. You know, those outcomes. It succeeds more because they got to see someone really excited and passionate and curious and heartbroken and overjoyed about the humanities or about whatever your field is. And I feel like pieces of that showed up maybe in the webisodes. You know, I think maybe the curiosity showed up in the way we narrated the museums. I mean, hopefully as they listened to 20 Bethel faculty from different disciplines talk about this, that came through a little bit. But I didn't feel it. And this probably is not all that important in the greater scheme. It might just have to be something that professors like us learn to live with if this is the frontier. And maybe we need to do better at listening to um, the data-driven side. I will say, however, that we're at an important moment in Bethel in terms of what it is that we do. And I will say that, to me, the most important outcomes of what we're doing here are the most measurable outcomes. They're about the transformation of loves, fundamentally. You know, your love of God, your love of neighbor, your understanding of yourself, um, you know, how you're going to be the hands of God in this world. And that's very hard to quantify. And so I, we have another nut to crack here. Um, thinking a little bit more deeply, what, what really bothered me going into this and still bothers me is there's something fundamentally gnostic about online education. I, I'm convinced, Jay Rasmussen has convinced me that it might be possible to build community online. But it's not an embodied community. And the church, if nothing else, is embodied, is physical, and there's a Gnostic impulse in Christianity to be afraid of that and, and, and to fly away from that and, and to avoid other people, be frustrated by them. And what I realized very quickly is even though we actually learned a lot about our students, they did a lot more writing than they would normally do in class, they probably turned out better writers than they normally would in CWC. I, I don't know if I knew them. I knew an avatar of them. I knew a persona that they created, and they encountered me as a persona. And we do that in the classroom. We're doing that right now. 
you know, you were projecting something, I am projecting something that may or may not line up with the reality of who we are. But I feel like I have a better instinct sense of how accurate that is. Um, and I didn't get that at all online. I don't even know what my students are. And maybe it would be different if we had them as kind of synchronous, you know, we're talking at least face to face. That would probably help alleviate this concern a little bit. But what bothers me more, getting back to Bethlehem's mission. I studied Carl Lundquist a lot, as many of you know, and you're probably saying, where's the Carl Lundquist quote? Well, here it is. <laughs> the very most, the most important thing I think our long-term, long-time president from 1954 to 82 ever said was, in the end, the most important thing about Bethel is the impact of one life on another. And he went on to say, what we most need to do is make sure the accoutrements of education don't get in the way. And he talked about testing and credits and curriculum. And he talked about physical space and technology. You know, those can all help aid this, but the most important thing is lives are impacting each other. And that's not just teacher and student, it's student and student, it's co-curricular staff, students, it's alumni students, it's people going on mission trip, I mean, there are lots of them. I'm not sure that can happen online in the way that it does face-to-face. -face. We're, we're also still in the infancy, and I've done this one time, so I, I say this knowing that I might be wrong. But I think that's something to keep foremost in mind. Okay, having said why not to do online, Here's how you do online uh, teaching, as we think about our takeaway. This is going to happen. I, I am under no delusions that this will just vanish tomorrow, or a genie is going to grant me a wish and say you can go back to 1959 when Carl Lundquist wrote those words. We will have online. Bethel will do it. And so some possible wisdom we have to share about how to do that well. And Sam, I think, that's the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think uh, I've often heard people say, like, you know, in, in business, you can have things fast, you can have things cheap, you can have things well. You can have two out of the three, but you can't have all three. Um, and when I think about online at Bethel, I think the third one's not negotiable. I think teaching well, um, that these, these courses are, are created well and taught well is, um, is really, really important. And so this leads me to think about, well, what do I mean by well? Um, well, as we've already said, for me, well comes from the gut, right? It comes from, from not ignoring um, the instincts you have as a teacher. Well is something that takes time. Um, that that, that it, it, it takes, in, in some cases, it's going to take a lot of time. It takes attention to detail. Um, but there's no one way to do it. I mean, one, of, one of our takeaways, one of the reasons we didn't show you a bunch of stuff is because we don't actually think this is what people should do. We're not saying, oh, if you just follow our model. Our model is probably really, really hard for, it was really, really hard for us to do. It would be hard for, for, for anybody to do. So we're not saying that. There's not one way to do this. But I think it is worth thinking about what teaching well might, might mean. Um, I think that it's hard, it's something that's hard to quantify on a report, um, and we are living in a time where quantifying things on reports is really important, where everything seems to be quantified on a report. Um, it's hard to find, at least for me, in accessible outcomes, but I think where you do find it is on the open sea, and that's where, as, as I think we start, and we're going to talk a little bit um, as we end here about sort of what it might look like to support teaching well online. Um, here at Bethel, I think that's one of the, I, I go back to that, that quote about sort of longing for the open sea. I think that's where we can find teaching well. Um, second then, uh, how, how do you support something like this? You can have a professor with a great idea, um, but there's different kinds of support that are necessary. And so Sam's way of thinking about this, if you're some late self and training, what would you need to provide to these instructors um, in order to do online well, whether it's going to be fast or cheap? Um, and it's at a couple of levels that we'll talk about. One is administrative, and then Sam will talk about the technical side. Sam said before, but I just want to say it again. We were just hugely supported and encouraged by Deb first and foremost. She's the one who really pitched this to us and, and stood by us. Um, and let us take seven years to do it. Yeah. <laughs> just did not rush us through it. Um, it's not looking over our shoulder in any way. We were very excited to hear anything we're doing. It was encouraging. Um, the, the, Sam mentioned we got an online grant. We also got department computing grants. We appreciate uh, TLTR, the people who do that kind of work. Um, and lots of other people. We're in an institutional reset, and you've heard a lot of talk about trust in this place. Deb talked about, and Deb Harless talked about factory retreat. Um, that's a very complicated issue. I will just say, one thing that sustained me is I felt like we had the trust of the administration, and likewise, we trusted them to, to do, who knows what's going to happen with this. I, I basically trust our administrators to use this properly. Um, but the other really important thing, and again, this will be something Dave and I talked about in two weeks, is that maybe especially in a pietist institution, which has a suspicion of, um, of fixed patterns and of institutionalization, 
you need centers of autonomy in a pietist institution. You need little small groups, ecclesiola in the ecclesia, that are left to do their own thing. Connected to the mission, you know, recognizably part of it, go back to it, serve it, but are left to do their own thing, because that's the only way to re-energize it, to break this out of patterns, to force us to rethink. Even if we just land back in the same place all over again, you need to be challenged. That's why I think off-campus study is important. So I think things like CWC and humanities are really important, because they're also collaborative and interdisciplinary. But I, I think that's the way to think about it. If we're doing projects like this, if the trust exists, I encourage administrators and department chairs and others to trust their faculty. And, and not to say, well, but that's not best practices. Or, I mean, this, this is not what we had in mind when we started this. But um, to let them loose and see what comes of that, because I think it would do the institution a great, great service. Uh, in terms of uh, technical support, as I said, our production support model is hard to um, hard to repeat, and maybe we're not necessarily rec recommending anybody does that. Um, but there are some things that we learned from it that we thought were helpful. Um, and again, this is, these are just things from our experiences. Um, one thing that was really helpful was the fact that there were two of us, um, and really there really there were more of us. Um, I think about this course as a course which, in some ways, was taught by 20 people because. Last summer, we, we went through, we recorded about 20 to 22 hours of interviews with different faculty from, from all over Bethel and, and from both the College of Arts and Sciences and from the seminary. Um, so we had, there, were, there were a lot of voices involved, but even at the production end, that there, were, that there were two of us, that this wasn't someone on an island. Because it was one of the things, as we were talking about this presentation yesterday, Chris would, was incapable of teaching this course without me, and I was incapable of teaching it without him, that we really needed that. And if you're somebody who needs that sort of feedback from students, one thing, we, we couldn't get that, but we could get that from each other. Mm -hmm. So that actually was, was really helpful to me. I mean, I, I was surprised how little time we spent together this summer. I was thinking we were going to essentially live together this summer. But there were big chunks where we'd be yeah, up in January. That's right. That. There were big chunks where we were apart, but at the same time, we would come together to get that feedback to make sure what we were doing felt right. We needed to have some of I think that's the check on instinct, too. I mean, mm -hmm. if this, I mean, it could have dissolved into narcissism, if it's just you're an instinctual teacher. And you're the wonderful, and, but I mean, I think that we are different enough that I think we check for different instincts, even if we align with Absolutely. Um, and another thing, not only did we have a team of, of us doing this, but we also had kind of clear roles on that team. We knew what we were responsible for. And this was the, early on it was a little bit trickier because we were trying to figure that out. By the time we were a week or so in, we, we knew exactly kind of where pieces were going to fit. Um, so we knew sort of what the roles were going to be on those teams. Um, we also, without talking about it, I think came up with a, a really helpful project management model um, where Chris sort of function as the project manager for the course as a whole in terms of giving it direction, um, in terms of giving it structure, and in terms of kicking off all of the individual projects. But once he kicked off an individual project, whether it was a museum or a film or a webisode, then I became the project manager of each one of those. So I, I carried those through to the end. So we had a structure in place. We, people knew, we knew what, what each other was going to be doing. Um, so so we, we knew from the very beginning how something was going to get finished. We knew who was going to be performing what and This roles. is where I would echo trust and encouragement. I, mean, I think there's trust here. On, on the flight to London in January, I watched this interview between uh, Steven Spielberg and John Williams talking about how they collaborate with each other and how Spielberg makes a movie and then Williams scores it. And the most striking thing they said is um, they have never said no to each other. They simply gave my question a little bit, but they never say no to each other. And I don't know if that's exactly how we function, but it was pretty close. You know, I would write an outline of the film and give it to Sam. I didn't even actually see most of the film, so I just trusted Sam. Um, so this, this leads me to think of the question of like the person teaching the course, how much do they have to know everything about how all of the pieces um, are going to be created? Um, are, are going to work, and I'm, so you know, as I think about what would a model of support if I was if I was a dean, what types of models of support might be helpful? Um, I think about you know, can we surround really good teachers with um, with a team of people who can do some of this stuff, and in doing that, have creative equality between those people? Because that's another piece. Is although we had a you know project manager structure, there was absolute creative equality between uh, between the two of us. And then we thought we'd leave you. We, we've said we don't think this is a good model generally, partly because it's just incredibly labor intensive and you know, it reflects our personalities in a lot of ways. But we did think there might be some models here. Um, I was on a committee recently where someone asked about online CWC and said, oh, that's great, we should make a MOOC of CWC. <laughs> My skin crawled. It's a little bit, but I also thought, okay, but there's something there. Where it crawled is the reason this worked, if it did, is that it was small. 
We would need set 10 to 12 students per section, so we could do some really intensive writing instruction. We could get a lot of feedback and expect other students. This would not work if there were like thousands of people taking the course. And you would emphasize entirely the wrong outcomes. You wouldn't have any accountability. I think we already worried about that. We were worried about attrition, and that of course would be an issue with you. Um, I think the place you could think about it, though, would be, I mean, I, I mean, the more I read about MOOCs, this is where I see the conversation. Not for like um, degree granting, but for like lifelong learning. And Sam, I know, has pitched this in a lot of places. I'll pitch it again. Bethel ought to be producing things like this to just give away to churches and to other organizations. And maybe it's doing the Global South. Who knows where this will go? Not so people can earn credits, but so people have a better sense of who Bethel is, so we can serve some constituencies. Um, and there are a lot of reasons, good reasons to do it. That's what I see the MOOC is useful for, not necessarily for us. It's like this is a way to get a head start on the Gen X or something. Um, the second model, if you're going to think about jumpstarting a much more robust online curriculum, <coughs> the place to start is not with best practices, but with the best teachers. That's another of our big takeaways. So Sam, I think you have a good idea. We're kind of running out of time. Yeah, so I mean, and, and it's, you know, I'm not the person to say who the best teachers are here or there. So I'll use somebody who we can, you know, undoubtedly say is a great teacher. Um, someone like Mike Holmes, university, university professor, great teacher. Like, what if we surrounded someone like that with the support staff needed to teach a really great online course? Right, what if, if so if I was that dean, that's one of the things I would be looking at is how do we find not the people who are willing to do this, but the people who can create the best possible things. Of course, there's a drawback to that. Which is, if they're doing this, and we're not doing it, so we're doing it well, and we're probably not going to do it all that fast or all that cheap, you're taking them out of the day college to some extent, and we should be very careful about doing that. Um, the third thing we thought, and this is something the history department will be doing in spring of 2015, is um, online instruction is kind of curation. Um, to some extent, this was a course taught by the faculty of Bethel, and we were curating it. You know, this was like a research project, going through 20 hours of film, not, I mean, we kind of have a story in mind for each film, but it really would follow what the interviews were saying. So in, in 2015, in spring 2015, our intro course will be a hybrid, the evening seminar that I'll lead, but then during the week, students will be watching, listening to a podcast, watching a video of our faculty, alumni, and students talking about different topics in the practice and philosophy of history. And Sam suggested other departments could do this. It would be really interesting to have yeah, if we were building an online course, what if you look at something like online intro to psych and instead of thinking this person's going to take that and do it, what if the psychology department taught intro to psych? So you had all these different people with particular expertise in different areas collaboratively teaching that and then have somebody who was functionally the curator of that course for that semester or for that term. Um, or intro to Bible, having the Bible department teach intro to Bible as opposed to this one person's going to take this on by themselves. I think we could create some really interesting, rich courses that way with lots of voices, lots of perspectives. Okay, well, we told ourselves in planning that we would leave 20 minutes for questions. We're minus two minutes, so... <laughs> um, I actually have to run to teach face-to-face, -face, EWC, but Sam might be able to hang around if you have any questions. Thank you for coming.